we're live. Well, good afternoon. Here we are at Holy Spirit Sands. We've already had children's church, and I tell you, it, I felt like a child of happiness with the children this morning at children's church. So, um, you know, Jesus says, bring the little children unto me. And uh, sometimes we're just like a child. So, uh, if Leslie was here, she'd be going, oh, yeah. But uh, so welcome to Holy Spirit Sands. Uh, she's on her way to a conference with the Christian Ministerial Association with uh, friends. Uh, Brock is on his way there, so Bruce and Cheryl. And uh, they're on their way to Kamloops. And uh, they'll be there for three, four days in the conference. And Leslie will be back next Sunday to preach uh, probably whatever the Holy Spirit's empowered her over this week, next week. So it's going to be scintillating. I just want you to be uh, ready for whatever is going to happen next weekend. It's going to, next week as well. But for today, uh, here we are. And uh, I'm going to, I am going to just start the, uh, our, <laughs> our time of uh, being in the presence of God. We've had a time of prayer here. We've, uh, we've addressed Children's Church. Uh, and we've had some good fellowship and a cup of coffee, you know. So we we opened the doors at 1.30 and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mary came last week uh, a week early and in the morning. So she's been waiting a long time for this, uh, the coffee. We had to get the, have to warm the coffee up, but she's had a couple of cups now. And uh, so, yeah, so it's afternoons. Uh, we've gone to an afternoon time of worship and the word and fellowship and teaching and ministry. And uh, so this is a house of healing. And, uh, and yes, many people have been healed here and will continue to be healed in a house of healing of the Lord. It doesn't matter if it's this particular house or any house or your house, the Lord wants to bring his healing to you. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth. Like Jesus, you know, uh, you know in 1 Peter chapter 2, 24, says, by his stripes we are healed. So... Uh, receive it and some of you know that uh, you know like uh, sometimes we are wounded warriors and uh, we need to come into a place and just as our cars need a service you got to change the oil every once in a while you got to take change the tires you, uh, you've got to <laughs> check the brakes and change the brakes after so much mileage well uh, as you know I'm I'm two weeks and a bit from going in for my major surgery. Um, so continue to pray, we'll keep you posted on that. I have my pre-op um, uh, time with my surgeon, October 1st at 9.30. And uh, I'm believing that, yes, I'm gonna be healed prior to it. And I thank you for your prayers because they're gonna go in and check prior, before, be, be, before they crack my chest and open it up and fix my heart. Uh, but whatever it is, God's hand is on it. And that's my point for today. Um, you know, Ralph, uh, he's, been healed, he had, he's been healed of cancer. And, uh, but right now he's got, this, he's got a breathing system to help him get more oxygen in his lungs. Sometimes we just need to have more breath of God <laughs> in us. And, and sometimes the Lord just breathes his nepish upon us. And sometimes uh, there are things that the Lord has allowed us to have through uh, medical situations that allow our um, life and our, uh, our living to be at a better quality. And uh, <clears throat> so whatever that may be, we have to understand God's hand is at it. And what I, what I taught at Children's Church this morning was keys. And keys of authority. And Jesus took the keys from the devil of hell and death. Okay, um, so he took the keys from hell and death. So we, salvation is of the Lord. And, uh, but <laughs> that doesn't mean that this, these bodies aren't uh, subject to what the world can wear down or what may cause things in our body to fail. Is it okay? Some of those things just happen in the world today. And we don't live 
the years they did back in the as far as Methuselah and a lot of them that lived 900 plus years and 500 years and or Noah who lived you know quite a few hundreds of years and like he started his ministry at 600 years or 600 years his ministry and uh when when you look when you look at the scriptures at 660 years uh it, it was like oh my goodness he, he's just starting to get into ministry 660 years where are you and how old are you how long did he have to wait God preserved him what is God doing in your life so right now I, I'm dealing with a heart situation I've had, I've had two replacement of knees one is titanium one is carb, cobalt first one was in uh, 2000 in um, seven and the next one was uh, 2016 and the reason I'm saying that is technology and different things the reason I got the first one is so I could get back on the mission field so the Lord had a plan to get me back on the mission to field so my 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 legs or my knees that I went in uh, because they were so damaged the doctor said Ray there's nothing wrong with your knees I said, well, I'm having a very difficult time walking on this one knee and the other one. No, Ray, you don't understand. There's nothing wrong with your knees. You don't have any disease in them. You don't have any difference. In fact, your bones are amazingly strong. But the thing is, you've lived at least two or three lifetimes on these knees. You just worn them out. Your knees have, your knees were never made to go through what you have gone through it, <laughs> your knees are just not made to go through that and you've worn them out so have, have you worn something out that God has given you that needs to be restored again I prayed for people when I was in India and the people who watch that can verify that because they're still in India and part of her ministry where I, I uh, just <laughs> It's amazing. I, 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 I had knee surgery so I could get back on the mission field so I could go pray for people in faith with the keys of faith. And, and, and uh, Pastor Sunil Chapla saw it and, along with the team of Resurrection Life, you know, in, in Andhra Pradesh, where I laid hands on these people with faith and, their, and their, on their knees or their leg. And, and on the one knee, on the one leg, it grew out because it was just a, it was just a, it was a pipe, like polio. The other, the other person, uh, again, the leg grew out and the knee was healed. So, but I, I had, to, I did that in faith, and, and I had a titanium knee at the time, and I prayed for people in Africa to heal their bodies and I had a titanium knee and a cobalt knee and I could still bend down in, and it appears that I had regular knees but I still had to go through the process of whatever that was and pray for other people in faith and God healed them and why didn't God heal me when I asked him well you know he's sovereign and sometimes I have to go through the pain to understand the pain of others and how difficult it is to walk on a crutch and you can't walk, or you have to crawl up a pair, crawl upstairs at night to get into bed, or 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 hold on for dear life when you're having a shower, because I don't have I, I, my, my legs can't support me, but I have the faith to pray for others and they are healed. I pray for myself, but God is sovereign. I prayed for people even in Brandon, which is not that many years ago, three years ago, and uh, where I, I, I prayed for, I asked for people who had uh, uh, problems with cardiac in their hearts to stand up and be prayed. And they stood up and prayed and, and they went to their doctors and went back to their doctors and God healed their hearts. That's, 
that's three years ago when I when maybe this heart here was starting to break down. Because I asked my doctors, how long have I been carrying where, where I've, uh, I've got three, vent, three parts of my heart not working? And the inside of my ventricle is all dead cells. And I got one bell that's not working. But I still have the faith. I have the faith today. So I'm praying today for anybody out there that's going through heart issues. I am praying in faith that God will heal you. As he will heal he, He's going to heal me. But whatever it is, he's sovereign. And his hand is upon me. And his hand is upon you. And I pray in faith that you be healed in Jesus' name. And whatever your suffering and whatever your pain is, that you be healed. 22 years ago, I was healed of diabetes. Have you ever heard of a person healed of diabetes? Well, you're looking at one. So when I went in for this heart checkup, the head urologist went back and saw my records from 22 years ago. He says, you're a diabetic. I said, no, I'm not. I believed, I prayed, and God healed me. I said, what have my blood tests have been for the last 22 years? He says, perfect. Yes, God decided to completely heal me of diabetes. And when I was in, uh, in Jamaica, Leslie and I prayed for people. I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating because the people down there are still around, but there would have been at least 200 people with diabetes that we prayed for. Pastor Donovan's online. He was there. <laughs> Pastor Donovan was there. It was in the First Baptist Church of Maypen. And they were crawling in to be healed. And God just healed them all. He healed them all. Even though whatever my heart is, I put my complete faith, as it says in Lamentations 3, 39 and 40, where I lift my heart unto God. And I am his servant and his son till my last breath. And the devil has no say on my death. He may attack my body. He may attack whatever it is. Right now, in, in the courts of heaven, he's probably there like a gnat, being whatever disturbance he can be about that Ray Johnson, this, that Ray Johnson, that, this Ray Johnson, that. And Jesus is sitting in his throne. And the Father is sitting at his throne. And he's just, you know, you know with the response... And the scripture that the Lord told me exactly about what I'm saying right now that is happening in heaven right now and is happening for you regardless of what we're going through in our health situation. But our faith must be alive. We must have living faith regardless of our perseverance that we have to go through. Whatever that perseverance is of the challenges that we have to walk through for ourselves and for others. So in Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 15, having disarmed all the principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it by the blood of Jesus. Amen. It doesn't matter what the devil is doing and trying to say or trying to remind uh, the Father in heaven about your sin or the Jesus about... He, Jesus already made a public spectacle. It says a public spectacle of all the principalities and powers <laughs> and made a public spectacle of them. You know, when you read that, I, I've got it here in the, in the, in the uh, I was going to read from verse 4, but uh, I'm just going to read chapter, just verse 15. He said, in, in, the, in the Jerusalem Bible, it says, uh, uh, I have to read from 14. He wiped away every bill of charge against us because of the regulations. It stood as a testimony against us, but he removed it by nailing it to the execution stake, stripping the rulers and authorities of their power. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, by the means of the stake or the cross. 
regardless of what the devil is saying or Satan is saying in the courts of heaven right now and trying to, trying to minimize who I am as a person or you or anybody else. He is being reminded right now of the spectacle. He has no say on my life or your life. And I pray healing and power and authority. That's the, that, that's the, new, that's the uh, Jerusalem Bible. And, and I, I wanted to read this out of the legacy as well. And you guys need to know what, our, what your authority is. Out of, the, uh, out of the Legacy Standard Bible, it says, having canceled out, and out the certificate of debt. He's canceled out the certificate of debt in your life, my life, and everything else. That doesn't mean he can't create pain in other situations because of what's happening in the world. But he, he in, in the courts of heaven, he has canceled out the debt having graciously forgiven us, us all of our, all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, <sighs> consisting, uh, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. The devil keeps trying to bring that up for you to believe it and to, in the courts of heaven for them, but the, the, the Father in heaven shuts them down. Jesus shuts them down. I believe this. It doesn't mean we, we, we're not going to go through persecution and trials. But we need to have the perseverance to go through it in faith. Amen. So even though uh, I was told I have to carry this. I have to carry this because if I have another heart attack like I had, in January, and I've had others. I have to use this, and I have to. And they said, "Do not drive yourself into the hospital, but have the ambulance take you in, because we don't, you know, that's the medical situation. It's the. Can you see? It's the blood of Jesus. <laughs> this, <laughs> this nitro, whatever they want to call it." I call it nitro Jesus. I got to carry this. I'm carrying the blood of Jesus. Even though human hands have made this, and I, I don't intend on using it, but they said, you have to carry this just in case. Well, I got the blood of Jesus, and I don't need the just in case. Amen. Even though the devil's attacking, he can't take me. He, 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 sin has no, I want you to know, death has no sting on me. Only when the Lord wants to take me home. That's another day. So just think about that, the, the nit nitrogen that I'm supposed to spray. Well, I've, I've been covered in it. Why, why would I need a spray when I'm covered in the blood of Jesus? But I, I'll, lightning in a bottle? Thank you, Jesus. I'll carry it. But I'm saying this is Jesus, lightning in a bottle. <laughs> so let's just, before Ralph comes up here, I'm going to read this out of the LSB. In other words, uh, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, each and every one of us, sons and daughters of the Most High. He, he has also taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having nailed it to the execution state, having nailed it, done and finished, Having disarmed the rulers and all authorities, he made a public display of them, spectacle of them, having triumph, triumphed over them in Jesus' name. So that is us as well in the blood of Jesus. That's what I wanted to open up with. I was going to share a little more, but Ralph's going to come up. You know, last, last week he's, he, he's talking about, you know, the seven things that Jesus wants you to know. Well, you know, and especially when it comes to having discernment, right? Discernment against those things that the devil would want to bring confusion into your life about. And right now it's running rampant out there all around the world. Deception, deception, 
deception. So Ralph is giving, coming back, he gave the first three, he's gonna start uh, number three again. So Ralph is an awesome, whoop, forget your, uh, <laughs> Your, your, your oxygen tank that, that picks you up in oxygen a little bit. But I, I just thank the Lord for Ralph. He is such an awesome Rabboni teacher. And he's an awesome brother in the Lord. And he is going to share you. You can go back last week based on the teaching that Ralph did on the first three. And uh, bless you all that tuned in on that teaching. You can go back, you can go back to it. And I, I, I just... It, it, it may not mean a lot to you, but I, I, I want you to know, even on the teaching yesterday, uh, Ralph did uh, his part three on the fear of the Lord. So you can go back. They're, they're all going to be up on our YouTube channel. Uh, that one's not there yet. It will be. Anthony will get it up. But I want you to understand these teachings are so important for you to have a foundation to have be brilliant in the basics of who you are in Jesus Christ. You have to have a great foundation and understanding of the word. And that's what we teach here at the Apostolic Resurrection Life Training Center you, on Saturday afternoons at 1.30. Today, you're getting a double-double, double-double <laughs> portion. And he's going into uh, part two of the seven things that you need to know. So, bless you, Ralph. And, uh, <laughs> Amen. Uh, and enjoy. And I just... The other thing, all you online, we appreciate you online all over Amen. the world. You, Donovan, I want you to come here and preach, Donovan. Yeah. You and Lisa, you want, I want you to come up from the Barbados Amen. Restoration Ministries Amen. that go to each and every one of the islands in the Caribbean. Bless you, Donovan, for what you're doing for youth ministry and children's ministry and that all through the Caribbean. Bless you, man of God. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, you woman of God, and your children who are growing up to be taller than their mother already. <laughs> oh, they're doing looking so good. It's been an honor and a privilege walking with you. How many years? Donovan was the first person to announce Resurrection Life Ministries. 31, 32 years ago before we started. <laughs> we were in Jamaica. And we were preaching. And Donovan, we were in this little, I don't know you know the name of the city or the town. You will, Donovan. You come and talk about it. You, you, you do a little right up there on what place it was. And do you remember how the Lord brought, the, uh, it was a beautiful sunny day, and how he brought that cloud over, that black cloud over, over the church. And he shook the church for how many minutes? 15, 20, 5? And you were up at the pulpit. And what you did at six foot six or six foot five, you went down and you were trying to get into the pulpit. That was that that was impossible because you're bigger than the pulpit. And you turned to us and we we're looking. And the place is shaking, and the place is shaking. And then it stopped. And you were up there to introduce us to come up and speak for the first time in ministry. Amen. The first time in ministry 32, 33 years ago in Jamaica. <laughs> And you looked at us on your knees under the pulpit and said, what's the name of your ministry? <laughs> we didn't have a name at that time, but we did have a name that we thought was for the church that we were in that wanted to change their name. So we looked at each other and we both said at the same time, Resurrection Life Ministry. And you were the first one to speak it Amen. into the atmosphere. And the Father in heaven brought a cloud and thunder and shook and shook and shook the ground that we were in Amen. in power and authority and it hasn't changed since. So Amen. thank you, Donovan, for being the armor bearer. Of the Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and I have to teach after that testimony. <laughs> now something that Pastor Ray didn't say about this heart condition. Um, he's had an opportunity to s testify of his faith and introduce his 
Jewish doctor who was a specialist on his heart introduced the Jewish doctor to the possibility that faith in Jesus Christ is why he's not he's not a diabetic and why he had a previous That's right. supernatural heart transplant many, many years ago. So <laughs> hallelujah. And as uh, Sister Mary was testifying how illness and the testimony of God's healing, supernatural healing, has won hearts. It's got people talking about the Lord Jesus. So it's not the troubles we go through, it's how we go through them. It's our heart attitude, and people notice that. And one of the things that Mary mentioned this morning was testimony. And sometimes the testimony has to be personable and it has to be real for a person to understand. Yeah. And so they can believe it for themselves when it's hard for them to believe regardless. Yeah. And when it's in front of them and it's right there, they ha even, even though as a doctor or, or whatever it is that says that this can't happen, it has happened. So they have to say yes. It is not a phenomena. It is the hand of God. Amen. It is a miracle. Miracle. Yep. They have they they have to be confronted about it. And sometimes we're put in a position to be in front of that person. Amen. So that they can make the transformation. Amen. From being from atheist to Christian. Amen. Or from be, being completed in their faith. Mm -hmm or whatever it may be because of the testimony that's in front of them that's living. Amen. And that's a, why we're part of the process of that. Yeah. And that's why we have to go through what we have to go through is because the other person who's watching and has bad opinions. Yeah. And they, they have to be changed face to face. Amen. And God's chosen you for that or me for that Amen. because he trusts us yeah. in the love of that yes. transformation. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 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 Father, we thank you for the testimony of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you that we can testify that Jesus in us has so drastically changed us that we've become new creations. We've become something, <laughs> something more than we could ever have been because Jesus and the Holy Spirit dwell in us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so we were... Thank you, Donovan, Donovan, for putting that right up yeah. on here. Oh, okay. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from all. Amen. Thank you, Donovan, Pastor Donovan. Amen. Amen. So we've got... Uh, I'm going to put him on the wrong island. I want to say Jamaica, but he's not on Jamaica. He's on... Barbados? Barbados. Barbados. Oh, okay. Uh, that's another story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't. But you okay. met him on the island of Fiji because they said we have to go do a youth... You, at your age, and had to bring... Donovan to be with George and the rest of them for a youth conference in Fiji. Yeah. And he came halfway around the world to be with you. Yeah. Oh, or your friend. Or what is ever. Yeah. <laughs> Six <foot>. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for if for no other reason you have to look up to him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh. We would trust the Lord that we'll get one day yet on this earth to face-to-face uh, -face with Pastor Donovan. Hallelujah. Okay, this is part three of uh, teaching seven, seven things you need to believe so that you're not easily deceived. And we'll, I'm going to list all seven if you haven't seen them or haven't heard them and then we're going to pick up in number four today number one Jesus is the Son of God 
If you believe that, if you're confident in that, that Jesus is the Son of God, you are believing that he is part of the Godhead, he is part of the Trinity, and that is a very critical point. Any teaching that takes you away from Jesus, divinity, takes you away from him being the Son of God, or takes you in any ways away from faith in him, is deception. So the, your confidence, your faith that he is the Son of God is the number one thing that's going to be attacked. And right next to it, of course, is going to be the Word of God. If the enemy is constantly trying to take away from the Word of God so that you don't have a foundation for your faith. So, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was born of a virgin. He had to be born of a virgin because if he were born in Adam, as the rest of us were, he'd have had a sinful nature and he couldn't have been the perfect Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. So he had to be born of a woman and of the Heavenly Father. And so Jesus was born of a virgin. Number three, he led a sinless life. He absolutely had to have not had any sin in order to take upon himself our sinful nature so that we could uh, take on his righteousness. Um, number four, he died in an atoning death. And that's where we're going to pick it up today. Uh, <clears throat> Um, okay, I'm going to. I'm. Yeah, it's just too important not to. <laughs> John chapter three verse fourteen, and as Moses lift up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now before we get any further, there's a lesson about the purpose of being lifted up, the, the serpent. What's the significance of the serpent that Moses uh, hung on a pole when the uh, enemy was killing the unbelievers with snakes? They, in that at that time and to this day, the Jewish people uh, know that if you are hung on a cross or you're hung on a tree, um, it's because you're under a curse. And hanging the 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 snake on the tree was. Moses' way of telling the people that the curse is broken. When you look on the broken curse, you'll be healed. And they were. And so the same thing here with Jesus. When he's hung on the cross, he's there for the Jewish people especially, would see that that man is cursed of God. They think of God. But when they look on him, those who look on him in faith, the curse is broken. The curse of sin and death. The law of sin and death is broken over them. The curses of their uh, inheritance from their Adamic nature is broken. Hallelujah. And that lines up in Galatians chapter 3. Amen. Uh, and just where it says, uh, let's really get it here. It just all ties in with that mm. with that particular curse. Uh, Galatians chapter three <clears throat> thirteen. And you can read twelve twelve as well. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who doesn't does them shall live by them. Christ mm -hmm. was redeemed 
had redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Amen. And that's exactly what you said there. And then verse 14, and what the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through that faith. Amen. So there, there's a lot with that. Amen. And the other part of that is the word covenant. And in, in Hebrew, it's brit, B-R-I apostrophe T. And what it really, what that means, it comes out of the Torah of Moses that was 3,000 years old when they found it. So it's the, and, and documents that are older, it's the old Hebraic writing of it, because you've got to read it from left to right. And it's, the T is the tree, and then the apostrophe, well, the I would be the eye of God, and the BR is the cutting of the blood. And what it, what it means and what it says, okay, in the covenant of the oldest Hebrew, before, uh, before uh, uh, Moses from Abraham, is my son who hangs on a tree. Amen. Is covenant. Amen. And it's written there in the oldest Hebrew. So those who are Hebrew and see it for the first time, their eyes are open. Yeah. And our eyes are need to be open to it as well in Amen. covenant. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. So we'll read the whole all seven of them and we'll try to get to the seventh one today. He died or sorry, he led a sinless life. He died in an atoning death, atoning meaning uh, uh, from a, a Greek word meaning to exchange. We'll talk about that in some depth today. He was buried, so he was dead, buried, and, <laughs> and rose from the dead three days later. He rose again the third day is the sixth thing you need to believe. And number seven, that he's coming back first for his church and then for the nation of Israel to keep the promises that the Father made all those years ago to the Hebrew people, to the Jew, we call them the Jews. Hallelujah. So just reading the list. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus led a sinless life. He died, Jesus died in an atoning death. Number five, he was buried, dead buried. Number six, he rose again the third day. And number seven, he's coming back. If you got those seven things solid in your heart, it's going to be very hard for the enemy to deceive you because you'll recognize if anything that takes away from any one of those seven things, anyone is teaching anything that takes away from one, any one of those seven things, you recognize immediately, this is deception. I don't follow that person. I don't follow that teaching. I don't believe that because these are foundational things that if you believe them, it's very difficult for the enemy to deceive you. So you get those things fixed in your heart. And then no matter who's teaching or who's preaching, you'll recognize error very, pretty quick as soon as they take you away from any one of those scriptures. Hallelujah. Just a couple of quick examples, and we'll get in trouble for it. But to point out those false prophets or those false teachings, um, they're... There are so many out there, whether it's the, whether it's Hindu, whether it's Muslim, whether it's uh, Buddhist, none of the, these seven things. But also maybe some things that are closer to home might be whether it's Mormon or whether it's Jehovah's Witness. They don't believe in all seven. No. <laughs> you understand? And there's other ones too that I could come and talk about here. But it's up to you to understand that these foundation principles are being brilliant in the basics for all of us in, as sons and daughters in the most High. Amen. Amen. 
Oh, I say, no, I'm going to pick it up again. <clears throat> so Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes, and that's written in the, cur in the present tense, he that is believing on him is not condemned, but he that believes not, or he's not believing, is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, or ne yeah, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds might be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. He that believes is already saved, and those who do not believe are already under condemnation. And the best definition I've ever heard of condemnation uh, is a damnable sentence of judgment. So if you're not believing in Jesus, you're already sentenced to judgment. Oh, hallelujah. Strong words, strong words. And the fact that so much of the world is upset about the Bible and preaching the Bible and preaching about Jesus, preaching about holiness, it's because they don't want they feel conviction in their hearts. They feel shame for their lifestyles, and they want to hide from it. And if they can't destroy the message, then they try to destroy the messenger. But, or, or take away from the ability of the messenger by shutting them down in any way they can, uh, by making a host of laws that uh, inhibit people from being able to speak, to restrict free speech. It's a tool. The enemy's doing it all the way along. And so, let's have a look at uh, Jesus died an atoning death. Um, atonement is mentioned about 70, 70 times altogether in, in your King James Bible, the word actual atonement shows up there about 70 times, 69 times in the Old Testament. Uh, and a whole lot of those, most of those are in Leviticus chapter 4. But in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, uh, for the animal sacrifices, and they get, some of them get pretty elaborate and the details get to a great deal. and the word atonement in Hebrew that is translated there simply means to cover. It doesn't mean to destroy, eliminate, or whatever sin. It only means to cover. And uh, some cases you might have to make a trespass offering and a sin offering and, oh, what's the other one, a third you might sometimes have to sacrifice three animals if you really messed up. And the picture is always is that God's answer to sin is death. God's answer to sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's as simple as it is in the Word. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But God made a plan, even there. In one of the uh, 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 steps of atonement in Leviticus, uh, actually two or three of them, I, I think, 
the the sinner who's presenting uh, his sacrifice has to lay hands on the animal and confess his sin over that animal. And this is such a perfect picture of the uh, atonement in the New Testament, which means an exchange. He lays his hands on and imparts his sin to the animal, which has to die for him, and he receives forgiveness of sin. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, it talks about an exchange. Actually, an exchange in the marketplace. It's a marketplace word that's translated atonement, and it means to exchange for something of equal value. So if uh, I've got two goats and you've got a sheep I want, and we decide that we're of equal value or something close, I may trade you two sheep for, or two goats for one sheep. That would be an atonement, an exchange. And that's what the, the cross is all about, is an, an exchange that takes place. Um, I'm going to jump to Second Corinthians, Second uh, <clears throat> Corinthians five twenty-one. Uh, and speaking of God the Father, he says, "For He has made Him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him." That's the exchange that's offered to us if we believe on Jesus and what he has done. That Jesus was made to be sin. He had no sin of his own, but he takes on himself all of ours that we might take on his righteousness, his right standing with God the Father. Hallelujah. What an awesome exchange. He takes all our sin, our sinful nature, and imparts to us His righteousness, His right standing with God the Father. So we can safely say as born-again believers that we have the same acceptance in the presence of God the Father as Jesus Himself has. Or... And 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says that we have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are as welcome in God's presence as he is to himself. That's an incredible thing. But that's how great the atonement is. That's what the blood of Jesus has done for us. When he, when we believe on him by faith, in effect, we are laying our hands on him, confessing our sin to him and over him. <clears throat> and he takes upon himself the penalty, the death that we deserve. And we have our sin forgiven, and we are imputed his righteousness. I, 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 I major on that scripture uh, because it's just so overwhelming. It's just overwhelming that what God would do and what He did. And, oh, hallelujah. Mm. Well, I'll just go with my notes. I'm going <clears> to <throat> fall apart here. Hebrews 2, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and to deliver, deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The New Living Translation puts it, 
Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he he set free all all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Hallelujah. He came to help us. He came to do that for us, to break the power of the devil. And we know uh, from Revelation that... uh, uh, I'm trying to remember where I. No, oh, okay. I'm confusing myself. Excuse me a second here. Okay, let's just. We're going to continue on from verse 16. We know that the Son did not come to help angels, He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing. He is able to help us. When we are tested, he is able to help us when we're tested. Hallelujah. And Hebrews uh, 4.16, it says that uh, we, we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. We can come boldly. So Revelation one eighteen, it just uh, authority, the power he had to break the enemy, a <laughs> power uh, over us. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. And have the keys of death and hell. When he rose from the dead. He stopped on the way out of hell to take the keys away from Satan. So the authority of death and hell are in Jesus' hands now. And for those who have, were in bondage of fear because they were afraid of death all their lives, because Jesus now has the keys, we don't need to be afraid of hell and death. We don't need to be afraid because Jesus has the keys. So, anyway. So Jesus was dead, buried, and went to hell. A lot of people don't want to believe that, of course, but... Dead and buried. Now, we know because we've, so many of us have read all the scriptures and the story of his uh, his crucifixion. We know that have a blessed day, Mary. Yes. Oh, I got the preaching away from my notes. <laughs> oh. Anyway. So, we know for sure that Jesus died because we have eyewitnesses to tell us that he did. The centurion <clears throat> saw 
and actually said of him, this, this was the son of God because he didn't die from his wounding or from the beating or from the crucifixion. He said he let go. He let his spirit go. Centurion has never seen anyone do that before. He said, Father, receive my spirit, and he died. Centurion said, Surely this man was the Son of God. And so they didn't break any bones of his body. Now, typically, they were in a hurry to get these other two thieves off the cross because the um, uh, high holiday, the uh, Passover was the special high holiday Passover, which happens on Thursday, by the way, in that year. Uh, so he, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought there. They would break the legs of those who were crucified as so they couldn't push up enough to get a breath and they would suffocate very quickly, which is the normal way of dying. You get to the place where you can no longer push up, get tired, and you su die of suffocation. Remember, this is one of the worst tortures men have ever invented to, to, <laughs> to test someone with. So they did not break Jesus' legs, which fulfilled a prophecy. It said there is not going to be a single bone of his broken. It's not a single bone broken. Hallelujah. But because his job is, the centurion's job is to make sure that people die on the cross, that they, the job is finished, he takes a spear runs Jesus through just to make sure he's dead. And a curious thing happens. It says it runs out blood and water. Well, that's weird a little bit. Unless you know something. One, Jesus probably died of a, a heart failure, a, a broken heart. Uh, certainly he he died a broken heart because of his separation from the Father. But when you die, the blood, the... Um, oh, what's the right word for it I'm thinking of? The... Uh, Plasma? Uh, I'm thinking of the, 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 the water. Um... The plasma, the plasma, the blood plasma starts to separate from the red blood cells. And that takes, that happens after some period of time. So Jesus has been dead for some time when the centurion runs him through with the sword. Uh, so that the plasma has started to separate from the red blood cells. So what ran out was the relatively clear plasma and a concentration of the red blood cells, so it appeared that blood and water ran out. So he had, was dead and had been dead for some length of time. He was dead and had been dead for some length of time. Hallelujah. So we know he died. And we know the story, of course, how uh, he was buried in a new tomb and we know that the uh, religious leaders said, we heard him say that he'd be raised on the third day, so we need to be really sure that his disciples don't come and steal the body away in the night and claim that he was raised from the dead. So they uh, got Pilate to order a guard to guard the tomb to make sure he was dead, buried, and stayed there. And uh, now the lie. <laughs> These, we, the uh, the lie. The the the. Uh, uh, 
Oh, yeah, okay. That's, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but we'll go there anyway. The uh, Roman guard who was paid uh, by the religious leaders, it says in King James, large money. <laughs> in Greek, mega, mega money. They had to be paid a very large bribe and the promise that the religious leaders would protect them from the uh, governor if he heard the story that they had fallen asleep on the job because the centurions don't go to sleep on the job. First of all, they have short shifts of four hours. So, you know, you can... You can struggle, but stay awake for four hours. And the other thing is, if you did fall asleep, if some Roman soldier fell asleep on the guard duty, the captain of the guard or any other one came by and found him sleeping, he didn't get to wake up. You just ran him through with the sword right there. So Roman guards are not about to <laughs> uh, fall asleep. Uh, because they're not going to wake up if they do. So you know that these guards did not fall asleep. They were very much awake. Uh, they just weren't about to allow it. Now the fact that, or how do we know that Jesus went to hell? He, uh, he quotes Jonah. He prophesies from Jonah uh, uh, in Matthew 12, verse 40. Let's go look there. Matthew 12. Matthew. Come on, Matthew. I should put a marker in there. Matthew 12. Verse 40 it says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Hallelujah. He prophesied that, that he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now everyone heard him say that. They knew exactly what he meant because they believed that Hades or Sheol was in the heart of the earth. So you went there and you went either to the place of the righteous dead or the place of the unrighteous dead, Hades. And Jesus went there as a sinner carrying all the sin of all of us who would ever live. So he went to Hades. He went to Hades. And if we go to uh, Jonah chapter 2. Okay, Jonah, where did you hide? Did I miss it? <laughs> it's, it's in this book someplace. Well, who look at the index, Ralph? <laughs> Jonah chapter 2, I think, 7 or something like that. Yeah, I just have to get there. Okay. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm having great fun here. Jonah, Jonah, Jonah. Jonah, chapter 2. Uh, 
reading verses 1 to 7. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. And he said, I cried by reason of mine afflictions unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell. He heard me out of the belly of Hades. Or uh, I think actually here it says uh, Sheol. It does say Sheol. And he said, I cried by reason of mine afflictions unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of Sheol. Cried I, and thou heardst my voice. So Jonah did not have to live for three days in the belly of the whale, which is a, one of the things that people try to take away from his what happened to him by saying, well, how could you live for three days in the belly of a fish? He didn't. He was dead. He was dead and he was in shoal. And he says so. He heard me out of the belly of Sheol. He was in the place of the dead. So this is, Jonah is a perfect picture of the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died. He was buried. He went to Hades. And he was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Jonah is a perfect picture because he fully experienced it. And Jesus was saying when he prophesied his own death and that he was prophesying what happened to Jonah would happen to him. So he went to hell. Jesus went to hell. And the third day, now there's a scripture in I'll I'll have to look it up for another time. But there is a scripture. A scripture says that if the father sees a righteous man in Hades, he will raise him. He'll raise him up. So after three days, Jesus had completely fulfilled all the requirements of the law. He was dead. He was buried. He's in hell because he's a sinner. And the Father looks and sees a man who has never sinned in hell and says, hey, come on up here. Oh, and on the way out, stop by and take those keys away from Satan. Okay, and then stop over there in paradise and preach to them and take captivity captive on the way to heaven. So those righteous dead who are in... uh, Uh, it's called paradise or Abraham's bosom. The righteous dead went there. Uh, Hades was on one side, paradise or Abraham's bosom on the other. And the parable Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus, how they each went to Sheol, only one went to Hades and one went to Abraham's bosom. So, Jesus stopped and preached to them. See, they could never, they could not yet go to heaven, those who are in paradise. It was a wonderful place to be, but it was not heaven, as we know heaven in the intimate presence of the Father. Excuse me. And uh, so he, until he preached to them his death, burial, and resurrection, and he was on the way up, he was being raised from the dead, until they met him as Messiah, they could not go into heaven because he had not been raised. But they went with him. It says he led captivity captive. So as he ascended into heaven, he took all of those with him, all the righteous dead of the Old Testament. So paradise no longer exists. Paradise has been moved to heaven. And Hades, well, it's still there. And 
Actually, as bad a place as it is, it gets worse because it says of Hades in the uh, in Revelation that Hades, hell, was thrown into the lake of fire. So as bad as Hades was, it gets worse. The whole place gets thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation. You don't want to go there. You do not want to go there. Mm. Okay. So, Jesus was dead. We have witnesses to confirm that. He was buried. We have witnesses to confirm that. That he was in that grave for three days and three nights. We have eyewitnesses, testimonies that, that he was. And then we have all these testimonies that he was raised from the dead. Hallelujah on the third day. No. So he rose again the third day. I'm just going to list some scriptures. John 20 verses 10 through 18. He paired first to Mary Magdalene. John 28 verses 8 to 10. He appeared to, it just says, the other women. In Luke 24, 13 to 32, Cleopas and the other disciples on the road to Emmaus, he appears to them and they don't recognize him right away. The, the vision is withheld from them until he breaks bread in their presence and they see him. So... In Luke 24, I forget who it's, 19 to 23. Oh yeah, he appears to 10 of the disciples. In uh, John 20, 26 to 23, he appears to Thomas and the disciples. In John, uh, let's see. Oh, I just list a bunch more. John 21, 1 to 14. Matthew twenty eight sixteen to twenty, Luke twenty four fifty, Acts one one to four, and Paul has a list of those in First Corinthians fifteen one to ten, and Paul says in there of the five hundred that saw him at one point, and he said that the most of those are still living. So when he wrote this down, it said that Jesus rose from the dead. He said. Most of the four of the 500 witnesses who saw him are still alive. So if you're not sure about my testimony, go talk to them. So, in their glorified bodies. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. But go, you can test them. So, the the evidence, the eyewitness evidence, that is so just piled on top. One on top of another, and another, and another, and another, uh, that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. It's even written by many other documents that, other than the Bible. Yeah. Josephus wrote about yeah. it. The Romans, like, uh, you know, based on that that bribe that you're talking about in Matthew, uh, Matthew twenty-eight eleven to fifteen. You know, that was a bribe. Uh, that has held people in captivity to this day. Yeah, yeah, it's a deception. It, it's a it's a bribe by uh, by Satan by by financial. What would you call silver or <laughs> gold or whatever it is to hold people in captivity to not to believe the lie and to be held uh, in Amen. captivity in the prison, to not hear or l listen to the truth. Amen. And there's a perfect example of not believing something or deception trying to take away from a truth. If you tell the lie enough, they'll believe in it. Yeah. Hitler did it, 
and many of the other disp despots in the in in many other countries around the world always did that. Yeah, they kept saying the lie until you believed it. Yeah. So what are you listening to today? That's Amen. a lie. So that's deceiving. So this is this is the first time that the. Uh, testimony of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead on the third day. The first time that it was being attacked, it's like the next day it's being attacked by the lie. That oh no no they, to this day to this and it, to this day yes and to this day and uh, hallelujah. So there are just floods of evidence that it. It's true. And anybody that tries to take away from it, as did the religious leaders that, that, of that time, they're deceiving. They are deceivers. So if you believe it, and you see anybody teaching anything that takes away from his resurrection on the third day, you know it's deception. You know you're being deceived if that's happening. So it's one of those things, if you believe it, get it settled in your heart that it's true, then you're going to be hard to deceive. And the seventh thing, he is coming back. Jesus promised that he's coming back. There's whole volumes of libraries full of books about his coming back and about the rapture of the church and people just claiming that it's so and some claiming it's not and by the way recently I found two or three that I thought were you know fairly stable teachers but they're questioning the rapture of Jesus coming back for the church they're questioning it Deception. They're deceiving people into thinking that Jesus is not yet or not going to come back for the church as he promised. That they're going to go through tribulation. They're going to suffer under the wrath of God. Not going to happen. Jesus is coming back for his church. Oh. I'm trying to remember. I photocopied a handwritten note, and it's hard to read. Now, this is um, the scriptures containing, or about the resurrection, or, or excuse me, <clears throat> about the rapture. By the way, rapture, of course, is not a word that you hear in your English Bible. When the Greek was translated into Latin for the uh, early church in Rome, before it was the Roman Catholic Church, <clears throat> they translated harpazo from the, from the Greek harpazo, meaning to snatch away, to rapturo, which is the Latin equivalent of the, to being snatched away. So, from rapturo is where we get the word rapture in English. And that's where it comes from. It just comes from the Latin translation of the Greek scripture. So, rapturo. Now, <clears throat> I've been listening of late to two or three really good sound scholars uh, talking about the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and the writings, the scriptures and the writings we have of the early church fathers, how they wrote and how they all consistently believed in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. So... <laughs> If you hear anyone saying that J.N. Darby invented this rapture of the church a hundred years ago, they're lying, they're de deceived, or are deceiving you. 
because Darby didn't invent the idea of the pre-tribulation rapture. The early church fathers were writing about it in the first generation after the disciples passed. This was common knowledge and wrote about by all the early church fathers. It was 200 years later, almost the year 300 or a little further on, that one unbelieving liar started to question and influenced a whole lot of people to question the pre-tribulation rapture. And that lie continues to this day. And, and one of the things to understand back then, they didn't use the name church because no. that didn't happen until the 1600s and when King James uh, changed the word ecclesia to church. In other words, everything that was related, in what you're talking about, in the first 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, they always referred it to the ecclesia, yeah. which was, let's say, um, the, the governing body of the sons and daughters collectively as one. Amen. Because there's only one, there, was, there wasn't multiple denominations, there was just one, one. the way. Yeah, man. <laughs> the one ecclesia of the gathering that was following Jesus in a collective group worshiping together as one. Amen. Yes. And that's um, the way we're going to be amen. raptured or taken out as the ecclesia. Yeah. Regardless of what denomination, and, and might, it may even not, it's for those believers who believe amen. in Jesus. Hallelujah. And, and the seven things that you've been talking about. Yeah. So <clears throat> there is no doubt that Jesus is coming back before <clears throat> before tribulation starts, before the great tribulation. He's coming back for his bride, and we're going to spend seven years at the marriage feast of the Lamb. Seven years at the marriage feast of the Lamb while all hell breaks loose on the earth, when the enemy is running rampant over unbelieving people and murdering everyone who won't refu refuses to take his mark and to worship him, he's going to be murdering a great many of those believers who, are, <coughs> who made it. <laughs> didn't make it in the rapture, but they became believers afterwards. They said, oh, we didn't believe it. And now it's, it, it can actually happen. So there will be a lot who will become believers immediately after the rapture of the church because they're going to say, it was true, it was real. The whole thing, the whole book's real. So there are going to be a lot of new converts suddenly after the rapture of the church. And, well, and as far as him coming back, the thing we call the second coming, uh, he made promises, the Father made promises to the nation of Israel. And the whole purpose of the tribulation is that Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, would be put in such a place of distress that they would look upon, they would call upon Jesus as Savior, and he then comes back for the nation of Israel. A huge number of them die. A huge number of people all around the world die. And all of it is purpose is to bring the nation of Israel to the place where they call upon the name of the Lord. They call upon the name of the Lord. Now, when it comes to understanding the scriptures, uh, uh, ding, 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 ding. so 
how do you know if a scripture has to do with the rapture or the second coming for for Israel? And this is a very way important way to test someone. If the scripture passage passage is clearly speaking to the church, the ecclesia, the bride of Christ, then that verse is about the rapture. So if in doubt you're reading a scripture that might be the second coming, it might be the rapture, if it's addressed to the church, to the ecclesia, then it is about the rapture. And if it talks about him coming in the clouds, so he's only seen by the faithful, then it's about the rapture. But if that scripture passage is clearly speaking to the nation of Israel, then it is about his second coming for the nation and region of Israel. And it will be, it will talk about him being seen by the whole world. The whole world sees him coming back when he's coming back for the nation of Israel. So if it's addressed to Israel, and you can tell that it's addressed to Israel, and it talks about coming back when everyone can see it happening, then it's about the second coming of Jesus to set up his kingdom here on the earth and rule and reign for a thousand years. But, but, if it's addressed to the church, it's addressed to the believers who are anxiously waiting for him, and it happens in the clouds, in the secret, in the night, in the, in, you know, if the thief, the thief who comes in the middle of the night, it's like that. It's it's not going to be, nobody's going to know it's coming until it happens, and then it's here. Then it's talking about the rapture, and the rapture, well, it's imminent. It could happen any day. There's nothing to keep it from happening right now, this afternoon, please. <laughs> So, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Write these things down, these seven points. In fact, I think we'll close by reading them, just so you got them one more time. These are critical things. Jesus is the Son of God. Number two, Jesus was born of a virgin. Number three, he led a sinless life. Number four, he died an atoning death. Number five, he was buried. He, well, he was, more specifically, he was dead, buried, and raised from the dead. Or on number six, he rose again the third day. And number seven, he's coming back, and that in two stages. One for his bride, the church, and the, the, what we call the second coming when he comes back for the nation of Israel. So we believe on the Lord Jesus and believe on these seven seven points and that you're going to be hard to be deceived. If you hear anybody teaching or preaching anything that takes away from these seven things, then you know that it's a teacher of deception and you probably ought to get up and run away from that teaching and that teacher. Um, with, with that, call on the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Amen. Uh, you know, just before you wrap up, let's just do an altar call. And, do you want to come? Okay, I can be part of that. Um, <clears throat> you know, Donovan's washed all the way through. And as, as part of the altar call, around the nations uh, with here there's a let's see that should be pretty much the whole world there yeah. on there and wherever you are in the world Matthew 24 24 you, you read 
your homework is reading Matthew uh, full chapter 24, full chapter 25. But Matthew 24, 24 says, even the, even the elect could be de- deceived if it were possible. If you have the Holy Spirit, you cannot be deceived because your eyes will be open to see him coming. The ecclesia is filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's all about Matthew 24, 24. It's about us seeing, believing, and the, the transformation of that. Amen. So whatever your eschatology is, whatever your study is, it's important for, that you believe. Like when Jesus in, in, in John eleven twenty five was talking to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you shall not perish. Do you believe this, Martha? Amen. And Martha and Mary, you know, both, I'll teach on another day, are shadows and types of different types of worship. But who are you worshiping? And Martha's response was, well, yes, I believe, you know, in that end day. She didn't have it. She had the religious teaching of the day, and she's staring into Jesus' eyes, believing the religious dogma of the day, and not believing what the living word was speaking to her. Do you believe what the living word is speaking to you right now? Amen. So I pray that the living word that's speaking to you right now, around the world, that you come to the place and say, yes, these seven foundational things that Pastor Ralph has taught, I believe. I have faith and I believe. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, I believe. Amen. I have faith on those things that I have not seen. But I believe in the things that I see in the Spirit. Because if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you will not see Him coming. Amen. Because you'll be too busy based on the destruction and the confusion what's happening in the world because you'll be leaving social media. Amen. You'll be leaving the bribe or the lie that's out there right now. And you're consumed in the chaos and go not see the king and the dominion of the kingdom come on this earth. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. We are the earth as it is in heaven. Come thy kingdom be done thy will on earth in me. I surrender to the kingdom. I surrender to Jesus. Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the Messiah. I surrender and I receive Jesus. I receive the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Virgin that he was born as Pastor Ralph was teaching. I believe that he rose on the third day in the the preparation. (laughs) You know what I mean? The the exchange in in regards to my purchase through his blood. And I'm covered in his blood. It doesn't matter what the devil is saying. The blood is here. He can't remind me of my past because it's erased. Amen. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe, I believe, I believe. And I have faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that I shall be saved. Amen. I I believe. I have a passion to share the testimony of Jesus in my life to others, as it says in Revelations 12, 11, I, I, I commission you to Amen. share your testimony Amen. of Amen. the blood of Jesus in your life that many be saved alive. All of you, no one is exempted from the testimony of Jesus in your life. Get out and talk to someone. Get on the phone right now and phone a person that maybe you're, you need to come in a relationship with and ask for forgiveness. I thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sins. And I'm going to get on the phone, and if anybody I need to forgive or ask forgiveness for, I am going to... The unconditional forgiveness 
the unconditional love and the unmeasured acceptance Amen. of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am going to be a living, walking testimony of Jesus Amen. To, to others. Make that pledge Amen. of your testimony of Jesus. And, and if, if you feel that you can't do it, have you given your heart to Jesus? Amen. In the boldness, go, go to what Pastor Ralph was talking about in Hebrews chapter 14, verse 16. Is that it? Something like that. Close, yeah. Yeah. Boldness. You need the boldness. Holy Spirit boldness. So believe. I think, you know, and so next week, Pastor Leslie will be here. Amen. She's uh, on her way to a conference along with the rest of the team. We're holding the fort. Amen. And praise the Lord for that. So bless you for tuning in. Oh, yeah, and Pastor Leslie says, don't forget to give people the opportunity to give. Amen. Um, uh, you'll be getting two uh, different MailChimps and on, on our, our MailChimps uh, that we send out. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to be on our mailing list, uh, s just message me, message me or email me. We'll add you. The two are is that in February there's an interna international conference that they're organizing in West Africa, and so we're going to need funds to help fund that and mm -hmm. also you know to help mm -hmm. send people to it. Amen. Uh, I I won't be able to go. No. We are send our sons, like Anthony yeah. or Larry. Yeah. Yeah. It's their turn to go, and the people in Africa and around the world are ready to embrace other. We want to send Christopher. We want, we want others, you know, from Malawi. We want, we want our leaders there. Amen. So thank you for your giving so that we can continue to expand the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ around the world and our leaders around the world to help them and help us to help them. So thank you for your giving and thank you for your tithe to support this church and thank you for your offering to support this ministry. Resurrection Life Ministry and Holy Spirit Sands Church. Thank you for the faithful ones that are doing it. Faithful, faithful, faithful. Thank you. Amen. So you can go online. You can go to our website, uh, www.resurrectionlife.bc.ca, and on there there's buttons that you can push uh, in, in order to give. It to, and you don't have to be in Canada. You can be anywhere, and it seems to come in. Amen. It's just the way it's set up right now on, on yeah. our website. We only give tax receipts for Canada. But for those that want to give, thank you. For those that want to give directly to Holy Spirit Sands to help this local ecclesia to continue to grow in what God is having us to do in this community, it's, uh, you know, holyspiritsands at gmail.com. Email, it goes directly into our account at Stride. But those who want to advance the kingdom of God, in missions, either locally or abroad, it's uh, resurrectionlife90 at gmail.com, and it goes into another account for, for missions Amen. locally and abroad. Either way, you get a tax receipt. Mm -hmm. And thank Canadians you for that. Get tax. Hmm? Hey, Canadians, Canadians get Canadians. Canadians, yeah. Uh, so so it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, and so you're going to be getting one... Mail, MailChimp on that yeah. as far as the uh, what's happening in February. Right. Uh, if I go there and you go there, it's we're going to get translated like like the what was that one that you you know as, as far as the Ethiopian eunuch that got translated. Yeah. To, well, to Philip did. Philip, you know, Philip to go do yeah. some baptisms. Yeah. If the Lord translates us to. To where the to uh, Africa, Africa and we show up there, you're going to get baptized. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. You're going to be on one side, I'm going to be on. We're mm -hmm. just going to be baptizing people in the name of the mm -hmm. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. So, praise God for things that are happening. So, Amen. so bless you in that. And for those that have given their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, you can go to our website on the left hand side. There's a widget and it says contact Jesus. There's a step by step step by step that you can print out. That'll guide you through the Amen. guide you through the prayers and the scriptures for that. 
And if you do that, give us, uh, you've got the emails, just email us and we'll be in contact with you. If you're a different part of Canada, around the states or in the world, and you, see, you need a church, uh, we're, you know, we're ho- we've got a network. We're hooked up around the world so we can direct you to one in that area or that nation. So bless you until we see you either <laughs> next week when Leslie's here to preach or uh, we'll see you whenever. The old Pentecostals used to have a, a, an expression, we'll see you here, mm-hmm. there, or in the air. Well, uh, <laughs> here, there, or in the air. We have faith for that, and we Amen. thank the Lord Jesus. So bless you for watching. Bless you for your support, and bless you for your prayers. Bless you for your prayers. Amen. And your provision. We need them both. Bless you. Thank you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom, placing on you his names, Jehovah, <clears throat> excuse me, Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer, and Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. The Lord bless you. <laughs>